also like to say this morning, I, I saw the message and the title of the message in the scripture when I was sitting down here earlier. And, and uh, those who put them together with the picture, I mean, they're, they're just so great. Uh, just, we just have that picture and we see the passage, which reminds us uh, of what we're going to study this morning. So this morning, uh, we'll be reading from the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. 15 through 25. Here we read God's inspired, his infallible word. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. And, and this is really part of our focus this morning. Verse 18, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable to him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, and he closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, Now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. May God bless his word to us this morning, and may his son Jesus Christ receive all the praise. This morning, the introduction to this message is a little bit different than most of mine. It's, it's longer, and I hope you bear with me, because I think it's important to, to set up the topic from this passage this morning uh, of what we'll be looking at. You know, back in May, uh, I received an email from the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and this email was entitled, The Pandemic of Loneliness, and then there was the subtitle, The Church Has the Answer. And it was written by Eric Metaxas. This Breakpoint article, now some of these are, are, are on radio too. You can listen to them, they're short, and, uh, or you can get them by email. And I've been receiving them. I, I don't know why, but I am receiving, receiving them, and they are good. So it begins by asking the question, do you feel lonely? Join the crowd. Loneliness has reached pandemic levels, but there is hope. It's become a truism. Never have we been more connected as Americans, and never have we felt lonelier. Isn't that interesting that he points that out? According to the nationwide study of 20,000 people by the Cigna Health Insurance Company, nearly half of the respondents say they feel alone or left out always or some of the time. And, and also the national public radio states, 55% reported they sometimes or always felt as if the people around them are not necessarily with them. 40% said they lack companionship and their relationships aren't meaningful and they experience feelings of isolation. And then using the UCLA loneliness scale, Cigna found that most Americans are considered lonely. 
the average score on the scale is 44, with the higher number indicating more loneliness. But this social malady isn't distributed evenly across the age groups. It's some, it seems that younger people are the lonelier, are the lonelier ones. The so-called greatest generation, those 72 and older, is the least lonely group, scoring and averaging uh, 38.6 on the loneliness scale, followed by the baby boomers, the millennials. The loneliest group is also the youngest group, Generation X, those born in the mid-1990s with an average of 48.3. Now, it's the, it says it's easy for us older folks to point the finger at social media for the rise in loneliness. And we may have a point. Back in 2017, psychologist Jean Twinge of San Diego University, she suggested the increased screen and social media time may have caused a jump in depression and suicide among um, young Americans. There's a world of difference, after all, between a virtual community and a real one. And then he goes on to write, uh, writing in Christianity Today, women, uh, Enuma Okoro observes that the false sense of intimacy created in the virtual world fa fails to satisfy people's real needs for knowing others and being known by others. She adds, after all, being lonely is not necessarily about aloneness, but about the lack of intimate, meaningful connection. And he goes on to write, uh, loneliness quite literally is hazardous to your health, leading to increased levels of depression, drug addiction, and suicide which is why, as my colleague, he said, John Stone Street has mentioned on the, the point, uh, the British government has now established a minister of loneliness. Can you imagine that? Starting in the garden, we human beings were created for community under God's loving care. And when we don't get it, bad things happen will attempt to fill our restless, lonely hearts with whatever is nearest at hand. As St. Augustine stated so perceptively, and I quote, sin comes when we take a perfectly natural desire or longing or ambition and try desperately to, fulf to fill, fulfill it without God. And uh, I just really thought it was a wonderful article. And that's not the whole article. It's just part of it. But I thought it might be important for us to use this article uh, to help set up the topic that we'll be talking about this morning about loneliness. Some live in large cities and populations uh, of millions of people. But we're told that they still feel lonely. They feel lonely in the crowd. And, and some feel alone in their marriage. Some of us remember uh, the singer Barbara Mandrell, a country singer. A and she sang this popular song, Sleeping Single in a Double Bed. And that, that title tells you a lot about this person was, was lonely, the person in the song. With us thinking about today's subject, I would like to begin by focusing our attention on the, this first point, and it's this. God notices our loneliness. God notices our loneliness. In our scripture passage, we see that it was God who came to Adam in Genesis 2.18. And uh, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. You could also say, ladies, it's not good for, for the woman to be alone, right? Do I hear any amens? Amen. June, you didn't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> 
I think all of us, it's not good for all of us to be alone. It's good for us to get away from the hustle and bustle of life once in a while. I remember at our church in Bravo in Michigan, and uh, I used to take some long walks uh, into the Allegan Forest. And there was a pond way back there, and below the, the earthen dam, below that pond, and there were some huge trees, and there were some logs that fell there. And I would sit on one of those logs, and sometimes I would do a lot of thinking, and, and I would also do some praying there as, as well. It's good that we do that. But uh, it's not good that we be alone. We human beings were created uh, to, to, be, to be together. Just like sheep, they gather in flocks. A and human beings are, were made to have relationships with others. It, it, he he is, interest, is interested in us. God is interested in us and our needs. And later after Adam and Eve had sinned, it was God who came to them. Did you know that? It was God who came to them. It was God who came to Adam and asked the familiar question, where are you? God asks questions. When Jesus was here on earth, he also asked questions. And I'm sure he knew the answers to those questions, but he was trying to draw out uh, uh, the feelings uh, of those he was, he was with. God did come only, he didn't come only with words of judgment. He also came in love and mercy with words of redemption for both Adam and his wife and, and for their descendants. God notices when we are lonely or when we are angry, as in the case of Adam's son, Cain. And God warned him uh, about the hatred that he had in his heart for his brother. And he said this, but if you, do not, if, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Being all-knowing, God knows our joys. And he also knows our, our sufferings that we go through and the pain that, that we have in life. He is aware of the cares that are weighing us down. And he sees us when we experience those time of, times of, of moderate or extreme loneliness. In that garden of delights, Adam noticed the dogs and the horses and, and the birds and others who, who, were, uh, who had their mates, who were of their kind. Uh, but for Adam, it says, for Adam, there was no suitable helper found. You know, a German shepherd might be known as man's best friend, but he or any other canine is still a poor substitute for someone of Adam's own kind. The late R. C. Sproul, Dr. R.C. Sproul, he had a video on, and, on Christian marriage, and I used to do that when I would have classes for those who were getting married. And uh, I enjoyed that series. And he stated that in our scripture passage, we find the first maladdiction. We find the first maladdiction in the Bible. Previously, after each day of creation, remember God said, and it was good. That's a benediction. But here we find the first malediction. That statement is also, uh, uh, but here we notice this malediction. And in this case, something was not complete. Something was not complete. And we can't be tempted to say from this passage that somehow God was faulty, that he made a mistake when he made man. Don't come to that conclusion because God is perfect. When he made man, he was perfect. But in this story, God, we see that God was not finished with Adam. He still wanted to do more with Adam. To fill Adam's need, his loneliness, God performed surgery. He performed surgery. You see this in verses 21 and 22. Notice that it was God 
who was the first anesthesiologist. Uh, we read that he caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. And then God took up his divine scalpel and he opened up Adam's side. And he took one of the man's rib, ribs and then he closed up the wound with flesh. In verse 22, and then the Lord God took Adam's rib and he made a woman and he, and he, that he had taken from the man. You know, God had created man from the dust of the earth, or some say from the clay uh, of the earth. But uh, God made woman from Adam's rib. Maybe you could say she was more refined uh, than, than Adam was. But, but the woman was taken from uh, Adam, a and they had a lot in common because they, they both were made by God, but they both came from the one body. Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, in his commentary on Genesis, he wrote this, She was taken from under his arm that he might protect her, and from next to his heart that he might love her. Fellas, remember that. I think there's, there's a lot in that. Uh, the great reformer, Martin Luther, he married a Roman Catholic nun. Remember, Luther w had been a monk, and they, were, they vowed celibacy, and the same thing with the nuns. Well, after the Reformation started, uh, the church just kind of unraveled, and, and there were some priests who married, married uh, women, and there were monks who married even a, a nun who had... Uh, who had uh, promised celibacy to God. And uh, we read that uh, Martin Luther married this nun. Her name was Cretina, uh, Katrina von Bora. And uh, we read that often Luther would refer to his beloved wife as Katie my rib. Why is King Solomon, he wrote in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9, Two are better than one, and woe to him that is alone. Now, this can refer to, to marriage, but it also can be refer to, to, to friends a, as well. We need friends around us also. In verse 24 of our scripture passage, here the sacred writer uh, gives us the, the basic ordinance which establishes the close binding unity uh, of man and woman in the bond of marriage. Alders, in his commentary on Genesis, he's, in Genesis 2, we, he said, we see that God had the perfect solution for Adam's loneliness, for his need. Well, secondly, in this passage, God came to Adam and Eve when they were estranged from him after the fall, when they were estranged from him. In Genesis 3, verse 8, we read that God the Lord came to the garden to walk and to have fellowship with Adam and Eve. But, in verse 9, in their guilt they hid from him. And God called out to Adam, saying, Where are you? You know, if God had waited for Adam and his wife to contact him, God probably would still be waiting today. That's the same story with us. If God hadn't prepared his plan of salvation for us, uh, you and I would be still deep in our sins with no hope of any fellowship with him or eternal life. Salvation is all of God. I think I've said this before, and I hope you never forget that. Salvation is all of God. Even the part that we do, God changes our hearts and our minds so that we're drawn to him, to love him, and to call upon him. The Bible tells us that before the foundations of this world were laid, he chose us in God and, and, and with our neighbor, he sent his Holy Spirit to give that divine spark uh, of spiritual life because you and I, as I've said many times, you and I were spiritually dead before that time. 
And then he drew us to the cross, and he drew us to himself with his everlasting love. For in John 3.16, our Lord Jesus told Nicodemus and us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, He gave him so that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The greatest cure for loneliness is fellowship with God through Jesus. And so this morning, if, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know him, or you know a little bit about him, I hope that you think of him more than just a historical character, a good man, a good teacher, but that you know him as God, very God. And he, pr- he proved that by his miracles and by rising from the dead. And I hope that you believe in Jesus not only as God, but as your Savior from your sins. And then we can start, God can start working with us uh, on our lives. And so that we become more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. But God, we have fellowship with God through Jesus. And if you don't have God, you know, there's that there's that void within us, that loneliness. We were made it made to have fellowship with God. Well, just as God provided for Adam's loneliness by surgery, so too, by the means of surgery, God provided for our loneliness by giving us fellowship with him and our neighbor. You might say, well, how did this happen? Well, the gospel writers tell us about the story uh, on Mount Calvary. When Jesus suffered the pangs of hell, when he hung on that cross, when he, when he died, it was only after Jesus fu- he fulfilled the scriptures and after he completed our salvation that he drew his last breath, and then he died. He took up his life, and he gave his life. It was on his terms. The man Jesus was truly asleep in death. It was then in God's plan that when the Roman soldier made sure that Jesus was dead, that he, drew, he drove that his spear into the side of our Lord Jesus. The blood that flowed from his side and the surety of his death was the payment for all of our sins and for us to have fellowship with God. God has the answer for man's struggle with loneliness. When I say man, I mean mankind. You ladies understand, right? And uh, some in this world don't understand that. And uh, number one, God has provided for us by instituting the bond of marriage. For it is not good that man, or we could say woman, should be alone. Number two, because of marriage, we have the family unit. There are children, and and there are parents, and and extended families to provide for us and, and to enrich our lives. Three, God gave us his son. We are told that there, there is, is one, Jesus, who is the one who is closer than a brother. And through him, we have access to the throne of God. And through his spirit, the Holy Spirit, we can experience Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when you have him as your Savior, you should never be alone. Fourthly, God has also provided for us with friends. Through the lives of Jonathan and David and others, uh, we see the richness uh, of true friendship. And I'm sure many of us can attest that fact, that how would we have gotten on in life without a a friend putting their arm around us and praying for this, for us, and, and loving us? Fifthly, through Jesus, God has given us the church. And that's what I, I saw a lot of the, this, the fellowship, uh, and speaking about the church in, in the songs that we sang this morning. Some folks uh, c- come into the church from dysfunctional families. And during my ministry, I have seen some very 
dysfunctional families. You just couldn't imagine uh, the dysfunction in, in some of them. And, and some are, are even estranged from some of their family members. And over the years, some Christians have told me this, and they said, the church is my family. And I think some of you have attested that fact too, that the church is my family. And uh, the, it, the, this means that the church has meant even more to them than some of, some of their own families or family members. The church is, is just a wonderful organization that God came up with. The church should provide that kind of fellowship to those in this community. Those who are lost, those who are hurting, those who are lonely. The church, not the world or, or the government or some organization, has the answer to rampant loneliness that exists in our world today. God notices our loneliness. He feels our pain. And he has provided the answer for our deepest longings. Our response uh, for the answer is, is this. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for Christian marriage. Thank you, God, for families, for friends, and for the church that is your beloved bride. As I was thinking about our renewal process that's going on in our church, uh, we need to be thinking about and praying for ways that the members of this church and the friends of this church who are not yet members uh, can find a way to reach out to lonely people. They're all around us in this city and East Chicago and, and Gary and Highland and Munster and all this whole area. There are so many lonely people. And they need our love and they need the love of God. We have enjoyed our Lord's presence and we have enjoyed the warmth and the fellowship of God's people for so many years. And sometimes I think we take it for granted. And now it's time for us to make work of intentionally reaching out to the lost and to the lonely of our community. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for seeing our sinful condition and our lostness and providing for us with our spouse, our family, our, for our dear friends, and for this church here in Hammond that has faithfully met on this corner for so many years, feeding the hungry, loving them, and sharing with them the love of Jesus. Lord, help us to more intentionally reach out with a greater urgency to enfold and to seek those who are lost. All this we now ask in the name of Jesus, who is the head of the church. Amen.